Greetings and welcome back to the gallery. I am the curator and host, Robert Cooper. This episode was very special to me because I got to interview one of my favorite photographers of all time, Jamel Shabazz. For more than 40 years, Jamel Shabazz has documented the social conditions, life, culture, and fashion of New York City. Shabazz began his photographic journey at the age of 15 when he first picked up a camera and started documenting his peers and his surroundings in Brooklyn. After spending time with the United States military overseas in Europe, Shabazz came back to Brooklyn to a world that had vastly changed since the time that he had left. Shabazz began using his camera to document the changes that he had witnessed and to talk to the people who he was taking photographs of to find out ways to deal with these negative changes. In the midst of capturing these changes, he also captured something else. He captured joy and the beginning of a new cultural movement that was known as hip hop. I had the opportunity to have a conversation with him at the Bronx Museum of the Arts where they currently have an exhibition of his photos titled Eyes on the Street. This exhibition will be on display until September 4th of this year. And guess what? It's free. So you have absolutely no excuse to miss this exhibition. So without further ado, here is my interview with Jamel Shabazz. The selection process was pretty complicated because I had so much work. The good thing about the curator, Sergio Besse, he came up with the idea of just keeping it within the five boroughs of New York City. And that was good because it, it, it caused me to just fine tune my edit. Um, what happened during COVID, it provided me with time to go deep into my archive. And I rediscovered so many images that I had no memory of. And I couldn't believe it worked from the early 80s, a lot of my black and white work. So when I was finding those images that have never been published and I'm seeing them for like maybe the second time in my life, I decided those are the very first images to go. So a lot of work you see is, is images that I just rediscovered, especially my uh, street photography. So that was number one. And then uh, the curator said to me that he really had an appreciation for my images of children. and He would like to include them in the show. So I started to go through my body of work of children from New York City and put them to the side. And I wanted images that, that, that told stories that didn't really need words that you could look at and, and, and they make statements within self. Images that indirectly deal with both social issues and current issues. So that was very important to me too because I just want images that people might just look at as just fashion and hip hop and all that. I wanted images that went a little bit deeper. And there was another aspect that people may not know about. And I, I sought to put images in the show of people who are no longer here. A lot of people have died and it was my way of honoring those people, you know, so there's a lot of photographs that are up here of young men and women who are no longer here. So that became the priority. When I returned back to America after being stationed overseas in Germany, I came home to a, a violent time period where a lot of my peers were engaged in active warfare, you know, unbeknownst to me. You know, I had a, a good friend of mine that didn't tell me until later on that he had just gotten shot. I came home July, he was shot in May. And uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of my friend's young brothers were getting murdered. You know, so I came home really much on a mission to use my camera to engage young people and speak about what was going on. And in that process, I was able to capture joy you know, and, and, and innocence, despite what had happened earlier, because all those things existed. And I and, and I do have that work, you know, because, you know, one of the things that I, I wanted answers to a lot of things. I wanted to understand prostitution and poverty and addiction. So I, I document it. But I realized that that work has its place. But with everything going on today, it was necessary for me to, to present images that represent joy because there's a balance between my work. You know, when I first started, believe it or not, when I came home, my father 
in my photographic practices, I was documenting a lot of that pain. And he didn't understand that. But for me, it was something that I'm, I'm new to right now. I'm just getting back on the scene. And this is what I'm seeing. I'm troubled behind this. I was documenting that. And I think that he kind of like encouraged me to, to photograph more of the joy. So within a, a role of 36, you know, one third of it might be documenting those conditions, mainly a prostitution and, and addiction, you know, and in, in, a, in a dignified way. It was a reality, but it, it was done in a way that it was, it was real. And I put that work aside. I didn't think it was really necessary to show that unless I was using those images to engage high school students about the dangers of that world if you're not prepared. You know, so you know, that, that work is definitely there, but I focus more on, on joy. And what you see with a lot of the, the people which I photograph, they're giving me back what I'm giving to them because I'm rolling up on brothers who might be stick up kids and I'm recognizing them as black men. Like, how you doing, brother? I'm coming in that language. See, I came up in a time, you know, in the 60s. I'm a child of the 1960s. We grew up with the mantra of nation time. And I believed in that, you know, I'm a student of the black arts movement. So I'm not just an individual with a camera. I'm, I'm out there now on a mission. The camera is just the compass that's guiding me. But I have a higher mission in life. And my mission is to use my platform, my voice, to address some of the problems that were existing within our community. The photograph now becomes evidence of the conversation. See, I grew up in a, in a time of consciousness, you know what I mean? I was greatly inspired by the movie Roots. And, and then, of course, you know, the autobiography of Malcolm X. So I've re I read a lot of books that gave me an understanding of, on life and, and, and the black arts movement in particular. I understood early on the impact that art and culture had on our community. So I came home with a determination to use my platform, my voice, to, to, to be a contributor, to add on. My community was all the way live. You know, I grew up in the East Flapper section of Brooklyn, also the Red Hook section of Brooklyn. I grew up in two really prominent communities. And I went back to those communities first and I reconnected with people I knew. So in that process, I built up a body of work first. And with those images, I put them in portfolios. And then as time progressed, I got my business cards done. And, uh, and, and I often speak about a book that kind of like helped me better understand how to connect with people. And that was a book by an uh, author. The author's name was Dale Carnegie. And the book was titled How to Win Friends and Influence People. So I studied that book and it helped me to understand body language and approach. And I would incorporate that in my process. And then I was a chess player. And in, in studying the game of chess, it's about observation, strategy, sacrifice, and objective. So I went out with a clear objective. You know, so when I would take to the streets, I had my camera, I had my portfolio with me, you know, I had my business card, and then I would approach a lot of brothers and I, I spoke their language. You know, and I introduced myself, you know, excuse me, brother, my name is Janelle Sebas. Man, when I look at you brothers, I see greatness, I see kings, I see warriors. Like, you know, so I got the attention and I'm saying, this is some of my work. So they, they heard my language and they knew that they were able to, to detect my intentions. They knew I was sincere because it wasn't about the photograph. What was more important to me at that time, and I think that that was, uh, that contributed to me capturing so many images. My intentions was about really to engage you and help help understand what was going on. And the best way to kind of like uh, explain that is, is Marvin Gaye's song, What's Happening, Brother. You know, that is a song that really reflected my frequency at that time. When I was approaching a lot of brothers, sisters on the street, I let them know, look, I just got back in the country. I've been away for a few years. I'm kind of like want to know what's going on out here. You know what I mean? And, and I engaged brothers in conversation. To my surprise, everybody was very receptive to me because I came in a certain manner. You know, my introduction to hip hop really came in 1975. Before we call it hip hop, it was just dropping science, brothers getting a microphone and rhyming. You know, so it was it was one of the many frequencies that I was on, but I didn't know at that time. You know, I, I knew that I was documenting a movement and hip hop was a part of that narrative. But um, it was a combination of frequencies to me, you know, because I felt that, you know, I was documenting hip hop. Yes, because a lot of a lot like the message, Grandmaster Flash, that was the frequency at that time for me. You know what I mean? KRS-One, you must learn. That was the frequency. But then it was the jazz element of it. You know what I mean? I came from, uh, again, East Flatbush, which is a combination between African-American and Caribbean. So then there's that, that, that uh, reggae element too, conscious reggae. 
is very central to my work. Jazz is central to my work. R&B, slow, slow jams, love songs. This is, this is a combination. But I didn't realize it was hip hop until later on when people start to really break it down like that because we just didn't call it that. To me, it was just our culture. It's just how we were. You know, even with some of the boom boxes that you might see in some of my photographs, a lot of times they may be listening to reggae. You know what I mean? They may be listening to like Love is the Message by MFSB. You know, it was it was later on, you know, through magazines like the Source and Vibe magazine that it became more clear to me that, yes, I documented this hip hop movement because it was pretty much defined as that. But for me, it was just an overall culture of the diversity of black of the black community, because if, if, if I put forth the soundtrack, it would surprise people, the different music that would be on that soundtrack. Of course, having been in the military, I was introduced to a broad range of music. You know, my reels have a lot on it. You know, the first time I had heard of uh, 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 Rapper's Delight was in Germany in 1979. Super Sperm, and a lot of that on vinyl, you know. So I was introduced to it early on, and it was the music of my time. Because, you know, like I said, back in the 70s, Brothers was rapping, but we just didn't have a title for it. So it was a part of my New York aesthetic. But it, when I came home, it was a little bit more broader me because I was more versatile. You know, because I had my real to real with all kind of music on it. I had a lot of, I bought back, I bought a lot of vinyl, vinyl in Germany. So my music is just really vast, as you see from my social media feed. So I didn't really look at it as the birth of hip hop until now. Now, a lot of young people tell me, did you know that's what you did? And I was like, you know what, you're right. You know, but I'll say that I was one of many because there was others that were doing it too. You know, so I can't take credit for it totally by no means. Because, you know, you have Martha Cooper, you have Jeanette Beckman, you know. Joe Conzo, who did a book called Born in the Bronx, where he documented the birth of hip hop in this particular area. He's, like, he's number one, you know, so I stand on the shoulders of that brother. So when it comes down there, I documented Brooklyn and Manhattan, but Joe documented the, the real essence of the birth of hip hop. You know, you have uh, Henry Safant, you have a lot of other ones and even unknown people that really weren't able to get that word out there. And that's why I'm trying to help them. But some of the baddest photographers to me in New York that never got their due and they don't even look at themselves as being that to really capture the birth of hip hop to me was those photographers on 42nd Street with the Polaroids. They were some of the baddest photographers out there. They really captured the movement. They understood that, you know, so hopefully one day that work will come up and that could be shown because to me that that's the work that inspired me. And a lot of those unknown photographers that, that were putting in that work early on. But I'm honored to be one of many. You know, I'm a piece of that large puzzle. Back in the days, you know, for many years throughout the 80s, the whole of the 80s, matter of fact, I used the Canon AE-1 camera with a basic 50 millimeter, millimeter lens. Occasionally, I throw the I have the 28 with me, throw the 28 on, so a certain type of feel. Uh, the film that my father directed me to use early on was Kodak, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Tri-X, you know, 400 for the available light. And I mastered that to a great degree because he surely stressed to me the understanding of available light, especially with my 1.8 lens. And uh, for the color, you know, I used Kodak uh, film in the beginning, uh, Kodak uh, 400. And then when I got introduced to the Fuji 100, the Fuji film, I like how it really highlighted the colors of black people. And I started working with Fuji for a long time, even Fuji Chrome. So for the black and whites throughout the 80s was the, the Tri-X and the Fuji throughout pretty much of, 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 of my career. You know, I just loved the whole feeling of, of the Fuji. And then in the 90s, I got introduced to Ilfit film and I started using a lot of the HP5 500 film always for all of my black and white. Everything you see here, you know, from the 90s is all the Ilfit 400 film. And I stayed with that. And I, like I said, I, I, I shot a lot of chrome, but I stayed with Fuji and, 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 and Ilfit to this very day. You know, no more, more no more Tri-X. That was just the experimental film back then because I was doing my own developing. I had my dark room back then, so I just loved making my own prints back then. And, and, and the uh, Kodak was what my father and his generation used, so I wanted to just keep with that tradition. Due to uh, the uh, 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 advancement of technology and cell phone technology and digital photography and the, the you know the instant gratification, now I'm seeing that photography is embraced and appreciated by people around the world now. And that's one of the greatest things that I'm seeing right now. Who would ever imagine that you could have a phone, a cell phone, and you could create these incredible images and upload them to a space like Instagram? So I think that's phenomenal. Even the idea of having a digital camera and having endless 
an endless amount of, uh, of space to create so many photo reels. My concern back in the old days was running out of film. I had every shot had a count, you know what I'm saying? There was no room for no error. You know, you had to properly make sure that your shutter speed and your aperture was set properly. You had to make sure that everything was right before you press that, 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 uh, that, that, that button down. Today, you can, there's a room for error. You could just delete it. It wasn't like that back in the days. I look at 36. I had to get 36 out of 36. I wasn't messing around. I was timing it too. Cause there's times I didn't have a lot of money. So I had to really be mindful of what I was doing. Today, it's just so instant that anybody could do it now and it's endless. And I think it, it, that's an interesting dynamic because it has developed a, a greater appreciation for the craft. And I'm seeing incredible work done with cell phones. I'm not taking anything away from cell phones. I'm not taking thing, anything away from digital photography. What I like about digital photography today is the fact that I can engage someone and I could photograph them and I could show them that image in real time. And I could see that smile on the face instantly. And rather than wait to get the film processed, now I could say, you know what? I could email you a, a JPEG or if you give me your camera, I'll take a photograph for you. Now you got it for yourself. And I like that communication. I like the fact that I could see that smile in real time. So I, I embrace technology on all levels. It's important that our work is seen in galleries, in institutions, museums, because oftentimes they could be in, in, in gallery spaces. But, you know, I try to encourage a, a lot of young people to think in terms of museums. You know, when you uh, look through your viewfinding, when you have to make an images, do give yourself that credit that you have work that could be in an institution. You know, what gave me the idea early on was the fact that I was visiting a lot of galleries and museums, you know, when I was younger. I would look at work on the walls and I saw that a lot of our, our community weren't represented. And I realized that I have a responsibility to fill that void. And I felt I can do it, you know, because I, I went to a lot of shows and I kind of like almost dreamed that one day I'm going to have this opportunity. And, and it's something I wanted. You know, I did the galleries at first. I did the one day shows. I did the two day shows. You know what I mean? I did a lot of shows when I first started. And that really wasn't working for me. And at the same time, I really didn't want to sell work. So I never liked to do gallery shows where there was a price tag next to my work. It was something about that that didn't feel comfortable. So I knew that what I needed to do as time progressed and I understood this industry that I needed to get in museums because what I like about museums is that there's no price tag by the work. And that, that meant everything to me because it didn't feel right for someone in which I photographed to come to a space and that is a price tag. And, you know, because it wasn't about the money with me. It was about making sure that our history and culture is preserved. So I feel that it's very important for a lot of young photographers coming up to think museums. And there's a lot of ways that you can get into museums. Early on, when I was trying to figure this whole thing out, one of the things that I did that some people may agree with or they may not agree with it. I donated work to institutions, you know, and, and one institution I donated a lot of work to was the African American Museum Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. They, they put a call out looking for work. And I had no problem doing it because I felt that's where my work belonged. And in the process of doing it, within a short amount of time, that work was exhibited in that, in that museum on multiple levels. Same with this institution right here. You know, uh, it, it's in the, the heart of the community. It's on the bottom of the list of New York uh, museums, but it's in the heart of the community and it's free. And they do a lot of activities for young people. So, uh, I, you know, they reached out to me, the Teen Council, an organization that works with inside this, this institution. They interviewed me and they gave me my first exhibition in 2009. And I was really honored that young people that work with a program within the museum helped to facilitate a very important show in my life. So as a token of gratitude, I donated a large body of work to this institution. And, and with that donation, within a matter of a few short months, this museum forged a collaboration with the Havana Museum in Cuba. And I was able to bring that body of work in addition to other work from the permanent collection to have the Havana Computer uh, Cuba, where we had this incredible exhibition. So I say that to say that it's important to, do, to build a bridge with museums, it's important to donate your work to institutions because now you, that work is in the permanent collection and it will be used for future events. So I feel that artists coming up now do give that consideration. You know, do write proposals to museums within your local community because they are great places. And I think that in rebuilding those bridges early on, 
put me on the radar when the 50th anniversary of this museum was coming up. They looked at me as someone that they need to consider to showcase uh, work here. So I'm really honored with that and I appreciate the relationship. I have a very intimate relationship with this museum, unlike others that you have to have a proposal, you have to have a meeting. They came to me with a great idea and I still donate and you know, I support. And that's very important too, to support institutions, not only through don donations, but whenever you can financially because they need that. Because this serves as an oasis for the community and it's one of the rare museums that sits in the heart of the community that's here to really help transform the lives of those involved. I'm currently working on, on, on two books. Uh, one I just finalized and it's the revision of my book, A Time Before Crack. I felt it was really necessary to revisit that book in that time period. You know, in, in the first book that came out uh, 2005, 2006, I, I, I effectively was able to create that book with great imagery that dealt with that time period, but there was something that was missing and it was the writing element of it. You know, so with the first book, I wasn't pleased with the writing. A, a lot of people I've asked to write for me, they didn't really come forward. So I ended up getting friends right and they ended up writing about me and not the crack epidemic. And I was really taken aback behind that because I didn't want the book to be about me at all. So I decided I wanted to do it again. So there's a complete revision of that book, new images, and every photograph in the book now really deals with the crack epidemic in some form or fashion. People who've even fell victim to, to, to selling crack, using crack, individuals that were impacted by crack. Uh, a lot of brothers and sisters who are no longer here due to crack. You know, so I'm really happy with that book. And, uh, uh, there's a lot of people that wrote for me. You know, I have a young lady that, you know, I photographed her and her mate and her young child. And shortly afterwards, she fell victim to crack in one of the worst ways imaginable. And her mate ended up getting murdered. Uh, and I have another brother. It's like so many stories in that book. So I had a number of people write from their personal experiences. I had a brother from my community that I was in opposition with. You know, he's a young brother I knew. You know, knew him very well. But he went on that road of being a drug dealer. And he helped contribute to the destruction of my community. He, I'm trying to build it up. And on the other hand, he's destroying it. And, uh, and he wrote about redemption. And I thought that was really interesting that, you know, we, we came back together after being in opposition. And I approached him and I said, well, I need you to write about, you know, your experience. And he wrote a really incredible piece. And a number of people wrote about that time period because I want the book to be not just a, a book that has these wonderful photographs in it, but I want it to be a, a textbook that the younger generation today can look at and get an idea on the epidemic that we were faced with back then. Because we look at what's happening today with COVID, but as I shared earlier, back in those days, we had the crack epidemic and the AIDS epidemic. And you rewind a little bit more, we had, we had heroin, we had angel dust, and a lot of people didn't come back from that. So I felt I had a responsibility as an artist to be more provocative in, in, in my approach to this visual language of photography. You know, I don't want to make fun pictures. You know, I want to make images that make you think. And I want to create collaborations with other visionaries that could help uh, help people better understand, you know, what we've gone through as a people. And that's where I'm at right now. You know, with my previous books, I was trying to figure this thing out. I didn't really know what I was doing. I just knew, excuse me, that my work spoke to the time. But the way I look at things today, you know, we're living in a state of emergency and my work has to be more provocative because it has a, a global reach now and it has aided people to be more empathetic with the struggle of our people. As I engage visitors in this gallery today, they come from different places, from Amsterdam to Italy, to Greece, to France. My work serves as a counter narrative to what they've been you know, being taught. And I want to revisit pretty much what uh, the idea that W.E.D. W. Du Bois had with the Negro Expo Expo Exposition in Paris in 1900, where he put forth this exhibition of positive images. You know, he gathered up all these incredible images in this country and took it to Paris in 1900 with the idea that those images would contribute in breaking down a lot of the stereotypical images that we, we were accustomed to seeing back in that day and time. So I want to continue on that path in hopes that not only my images will do that, but also my words and the words of others that have something to say. I would like to thank Mr. Shabazz for spending a Sunday afternoon with me. He was very welcoming, open, humble, and full of knowledge, which made for an enjoyable experience, not just for me as an interviewer, 
but also for everybody who stepped foot into the Bronx Museum of Arts for the exhibition. He greeted every last one of them and spoke with them and talked about his photography with them. That is what you hope for in all artists. In addition to being a great interviewee, he also gifted me, me, a photography book called The Harlem Cultural Political Movements 1960 through 1970 from Malcolm X to Black is Beautiful. Here it is right here, y'all. Everybody watching my channel knows how much of a photography book collector I am, especially black photography books. And I am grateful that he gifted me with this book, which I come to find out is very rare and out of print. So I am deeply thankful for that. And I will definitely be talking about this book in a future episode when I update you all on the photography books that I have. And it doesn't stop there because I visited the gift shop at the Bronx Museum of the Arts and I picked up one of his books. This one right here, titled City Metro. And we will definitely be talking about this book because Jamel Shabazz has so many books out there that you can hardly find any of them. But I was able to find this at the Bronx Museum of the Arts. But that's not all. I also got this book. Subway Art by Martha Cooper, no relation, and Henry Chauvant. This book right here is known as the Bible for Graffiti Art. Hopefully I get to interview both of these photographers in upcoming episodes. And of course, I'm going to talk about this book in a future episode. I would like to once again thank every last one of you who have made it to the end of this video. Please follow me on Instagram at rcooperphotography. Also, if you want to see my film photography, head on over to R. Cooper Shoots Film. Follow me there. And if you feel like re-watching this video on Instagram, you can also check it out at R. Cooper The Gallery on Instagram. I thank you all for tuning in. Blessed love.